This episode of New Politics was released on the 30th of April, 2022, and produced on the land of the Wangul and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, does an absent leader and a campaign make that much of a difference? Are we heading into a massive war with China? Peter Dutton seems to think so. And we look at the latest opinion polls and answer all of your questions about the election. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, Emmy award-winning star of Sex and the City. And a big thank you to our new Patreon subscribers. Thanks for signing up. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription. It's just $5 per month for the Ruby Standard Supporter level or $10 per month for the Gold Standard Supporter level. But whether it's a subscription if, or if you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a T-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. Week three of the campaign saw a very unusual development where Anthony Albanese contracted coronavirus and had to complete a seven-day isolation. And of course, the media thought that this was a nightmare scenario for Labor. So far, it hasn't been too much of a problem for them. And there are other ways to campaign during an election, as we found out during the US presidential election in 2020, when Joe Biden rarely left his basement and still managed to win the election quite easily. Other senior Labor figures have been taking the focus and filling in the gap during the week, including Jim Chalmers, Jason Clare, Penny Wong, Tanya Plibersek, Christina Keneally, Tony Burke and Richard Miles. It's not like Scott Morrison took full advantage of Anthony Albanese's absence anyway. It was more or less the same, not just the past three weeks of the campaign, but the past three years of his prime ministership. There was cooking, pulling beers at the bar playing two up on Anzac Day, fishing furry animals and echidnas at the zoo, making macarons at a French bakery, more cooking, photo opportunities with dogs and appearing with Michaelia Cash at a children's race course. And this was all in between losing the Solomon Islands to the Chinese government. Political campaigns have followed a set formula for far too long, but is having the leader of a major party taken away from the campaign for a week Is that a problem or is it an opportunity to be innovative and try out some new campaign strategies? It seemed to be a reset, didn't it? Mr Albanese's gaffes were suddenly off the table. I think having the broader party speak might have been a good thing. Now, Bill Shorten in his campaign gave a lot of time to his senior people, many of the same. Uh, Jason Clare, Tony Burke, Tanya Plibersek, Penny Wong. And the trouble for the Liberal Party is that they really don't have anybody who can match them. Josh Frydenberg is too busy focused on trying to retain Kuyong, which is extraordinary. Who else do you have? Peter Dutton, who is loathed. Barnaby Joyce, as leader of the National Party and Deputy Prime Minister, is not a popular figure, shall we say, outside of his electorate. Simon Birmingham is probably a better performer than most of them, and he's still not that great a performer. He was completely owned, as the kids say, on 7.30 Report the other night by Jim Chalmers, another very, very good performer. And for those of you who haven't heard it, I do recommend you listen to the interview that Eddie did with him on, on this very channel. Albanese leaving the campaign through illness which they had prepared for, of course. And this is the other thing. They knew that senior figures would likely get coronavirus due in no small part to the moronic and dangerous and deadly policy of the federal government and the New South Wales state government. So they were prepared to work around that. Now, we live in an age where a lot of people are still working from home. So provided he's well, And he seemed to have a fairly mild dose, which is fantastic. And I'd say that if it was the Prime Minister who'd had a mild dose or any of the government front bench, provided he's well, he can campaign from home. We have Zoom, we have mobile phones, we have 
the internet, FaceTime, all of that. He can still run the campaign with his advisors remotely. Joe Biden, as I think he said, did that from his home for a lot of the time because America was still in lockdown. The liberal or the government campaign, as you said, hasn't changed. It's still trying Scott Morrison as the everyday man, which no one is buying. It's still presenting itself as it would have had he had Albanese been there or not. And I guess there is a sense that the old truism is that generals always fight the last war. And I think Liberal Party campaigners and Labour Party campaigners until recently always fought the last election. Let's see how this goes. But I think that it wasn't the disaster the travelling press pack argued it was. Well, I think you're absolutely right. But we've been strong critics of the mainstream media, and why wouldn't we be? There's so much to criticise there. But once again, they've shown how unimaginative they can be. They were immediately calling Albanese's absence from coronavirus on the campaign as a nightmare, a fatal blow. It was a disaster. Instead of thinking it through and wondering if it creates opportunities for a political party and offers the opportunity to campaign in a different way. And the way that I see it is that the main issue for the media was that it created a disruption for how they want to play this election campaign. They're the ones who are predictable. They just want their neat little packages for their evening news broadcasts. They want to report on the gaffes and the mistakes. And having one of the protagonists off the circuit for a week meant that it was a nightmare for them. Their daily schedules were ruined. They had to think up of new cliches to run. It was them who were actually bamboozled by Albanese's absence, not the Labor Party. And of course, they would have had a plan to deal with this exact situation, as you mentioned before, as would the Liberal Party as well. So it's not as though this took anyone by surprise, but it does bring up another issue. How relevant is the traditional election campaign to final electoral outcomes? There hasn't actually been any shift in opinion polling and Scott Morrison hasn't really been able to take much advantage of Albanese's absence anyway, although it is hard to know what he could have done differently. If you catch it, you have to isolate. It's a very dangerous disease. There's still a death toll from it and there's still no real pattern except if you're if you have comorbidities you are more likely to get sicker from it but perfectly healthy people can die from it too and then very sick people can recover from it and every single variant on that is happened i'm wondering if it shows that the liberal party has lost its drive to win that the only people who are really trying for it to win are the people who have the most to lose What they're really fighting against is a a federal ICAC because a lot of them are going to be in a lot of trouble if the right type of ICAC gets in, in that New South Wales model. And Anthony Albanese's absence also brought up leadership speculation within the media that more capable members of Labor's front bench would supposedly show up Albanese and that's exactly what happened when Jason Clare delivered an excellent first up media conference and the media started speculating whether Jason Clare should be the leader of the Labor Party because he was more presentable and photogenic and some even suggested that he's more well known in the community even though no one has really heard of Jason Clare in the community. You and I know who Jason Clare is and most people that follow politics politics do, but in the community, no one really knows who he is. Others have presented well in the media from the Labor Party team. They've all stepped up and with it, there's been more leadership speculation. Now, I've got news for political journalists. A mainstream political party is not going to change its leader halfway through an election campaign, but that's not going to stop the media from pushing this angle. And and this is what you'd expect a political party to do during a campaign if their leader becomes ill. Now, it hasn't happened for a long, long time during a campaign. But I think it has given Labor an opportunity to highlight their front bench team. And and in my opinion, they actually do present as a solid group of candidates and the people who do want to form government after the next election. There's a kind of underlying hum that they don't like each other. That may or may not be true. I don't, I don't know. And I do know that political parties are made up of all kinds of people with all kinds of different opinions and all kinds of personalities. Those of you who are listening who are in management jobs or who are supervisors know that the worst part about managing people is managing people. But Labor Party, I think, has decided that it needs to be disciplined, that it will work with each other and that it might even try and be friendly, even if it's a professional friendliness, 
in a way that the Liberal Party is trying. We know for an absolute fact that Morrison and Barnaby Joyce loathe each other. Barnaby Joyce admitted that in a text to Brittany Higgins. We know that Peter Dutton loathes Scott Morrison. We know that most of the rest of the party loathe Peter Dutton. This has all come out through leaks and through which aren't really happening on the Labor side. Uh, there was a little bit of that when Kimberly Kitching died. But it shouldn't be any surprise to anyone who has dealt with people. And it, it gets to a level of maturity. It gets to a level of entitlement. It may be that those Labor members in safe seats absolutely think that it is only them who deserve those safe seats, but they don't demonstrate that openly. Unlike, say, to go back to Josh Frydenberg, who seems to be acting like the seat of Kuyong is his by birthright and that a strong candidate coming through might just be some kind of insult to his standing. And again, I'll mention Michael Sukar. Hello, shady Sukar people. Two weeks in a row, you guys are on fire. But again, you don't have that type of candidate, at least obviously, on the Labor side. They may exist. If you were to point out to me that the seat of X in Y state had a few candidates who shouldn't be there on the Labor side. It wouldn't surprise me because, again, that's the nature of major parties. But they're either hidden or at least disciplined enough to shut up and focus on the job of winning government, which is the whole point of an election campaign. This does not mean that they will necessarily win, but at this point they're in a pretty strong position. And last week, we predicted that climate change would start to feature strongly in the campaign, and some of our predictions do actually turn out to be correct, but it just wasn't in the way that we anticipated. Two National Party MPs have set up a convolution on the net zero target by 2050. This time, it's Colin Boyce and the King of Coal, Matt Canavan. Yeah, well, the net zero thing is all sort of dead anyway. It's all over. I mean, it's all over by the shouting here. Zero net carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, Morrison's document uh, is a flexible plan. It leaves us wiggle room. And we also have to point out that some of Matt Canavan's family owns substantial coal mining interests. This is one thing that the mainstream media rarely points out. Now, they're claiming that the coalition's policy is dead all over or has enough flexibility in it to render it almost useless. Morrison did chime in to say that they were actually referring to the way that the government would achieve the net zero target by 2050, not the actual target itself. Now, we do know that Scott Morrison will say absolutely anything to win this election. And this is just another example of that. There's no actual plan. 2050 is 28 years away. So whatever he says now will probably change tomorrow. And and as we found out with the cancelled French submarines deal, the coalition has no problem changing or cancelling long-term projects and ideas. Morrison has also started to ramp up his rhetoric on a carbon tax. And not sure if he's talking about his plans or Labor's plans, but he's resurrecting a battle on a fixed fictitious carbon tax. Now, Labor did introduce carbon pricing back in 2012, and that successfully reduced carbon emissions for that one-year period. And whatever you want to call it, it was not a tax. But that's not going to stop Morrison talking about it. So a scare campaign on a fictitious tax, reviving the culture wars by talking about men playing women's sports, these sort of marginal issues are not the ones that will win an election campaign. And if these are the types of issues that Morrison is going to campaign on over the next three weeks, well, I think the election might be well and truly over. It's not looking good for him. He's struggling. I've heard reports of senior liberal figures despairing of them winning any election for the next two decades. I don't think that's quite true, but I do think there's going to be a massive clean out of the party if if they lose this one. Morrison is looking rattled. He's looking confused. He's looking lost. He knows that his strategies aren't working and that maybe people don't care as much about Jen and the kids as he does. Your family should be off limits from both sides. They shouldn't be used as campaign tools at all. Private lives are are private lives. And I think that whole campaign has come back to bite him. Again, there are very cunning and a very clever campaigning. And I'm seeing rumblings in the seat of Parramatta of pork barrelling that might be effective. And there's a couple of South Australian seats that they're targeting This type of thing, which is what won them the last election, might be effective again. But certainly the the way he's going about it doesn't suggest that. 
Well, there might also be a whole range of issues that are floating under the radar that we're not fully aware of, and that's certainly the issue that developed in the 2019 election. But, but my feeling is that this election is different. But just going back to... So we looked at some of the issues for Scott Morrison. Anthony Albanese, he might have been absent for most of the third week of the campaign, but that didn't stop one of his policy announcements from being attacked. Labor has announced a $2.5 billion injection into the aged care sector. That was actually announced a few weeks ago. And the first attack of asking where's the money coming from, that didn't seem to work. So the policy is now being attacked on where are the nurses coming from. Labor's plan is to have a nurse on site for every aged care facility across Australia for 24 hours a day. It's an extension of one of the recommendations from the Royal Commission into the aged care sector. And this is a report that the Morrison government still hasn't acted on 12 months after it was released. And instead of focusing on the merits of this policy, it's being attacked for having to import nurses from overseas to fill this gap. The issue here should be, well, why hasn't the Liberal National Government created enough nursing places to fill the need in the community? They've been in government for nine years. There has been this nursing shortage crisis across Australia for some time, and I know it takes four years to train a nurse, and that can't really be fast-tracked to reduce that amount of time. So the logical extension is to fix this short-term gap by recruiting trained nurses from overseas. So once again, we see good policy distracted by bad politics and inadequate media reporting. I really think any reform isn't necessarily party reform. It's media reform. We saw this week that the journalist who on her Twitter page had put ALP trolls and lobotomized shitheads and then put a whole bunch of leftist and progressive thinking people in one or two of those lists has been stood down from on-air duties. That's appropriate. It's one thing for a journalist to have a political opinion and to vote a certain way. Obviously, you're not going to stop that. We vote certain ways. And Philip Curry, Andrew Bolt vote certain ways. And that's perfectly fine. That trouble is is when you're supposed to be at least relatively objective and note i said objective not unbiased you can't have this type of behavior and there's too much of it in the media soft questions to the prime minister impossible to answer questions to the leader of the opposition is just not on balance being oh we better bring in a conspiracy theorist because that provides some kind of balance, rather than we better bring in two people with the same expertise who might have different views and and see if we can get to a consensus, which is a much better view of balance, is just stupid. We need to reform media law. We then need to reform education. We then can reform the parties. I suspect that a lot of this will happen all at the same time. While we have a media that thrives on ignorance, and, and again, I, I want to reiterate, I'm not talking about every single journalist in the mainstream media or even every single editor. There are still some very good journalists around, and there are still some good journalists coming up through the ranks. Even ones I don't agree with, I can look at their work and say, this is good journalism. But I do think that there is too much laziness, there's too much poor thinking And there's not enough contextual critique done. And this is why we get Scott Morrison as Prime Minister and Peter Dutton and Barnaby Joyce and Matt Canavan and the rest of them, people who are just not fit to be backbenchers, let alone be senior power figures and senior cabinet members. This is how we get them because the media does not hold them to account, or at least not enough of the media holds them to account. We need a better fourth estate. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Up next, politicizing Anzac Day and Peter Dutton's big war on China.
Anzac Day was also held during the week and it's a day where those people who have died during war are remembered and this is the way that it should be but I think it also should be remembered that wars are caused by foolish political leaders and they're a clear sign of political failure and this should also be remembered as well. And there was a good sign of this when, of all days to announce it, Peter Dutton said that we should be prepared for war with China. The only way uh, that you can, you can preserve peace is, is to prepare for war and to be strong as a country, not to cower, not to uh, you know, be on bended knee. Someone should tell Peter Dutton that Anzac Day isn't about him or the Liberal Party. And if he was going to bring up this issue, you'd think that he would have chosen another day to do it. And in Drysdale, that's a town in the Victoria seat of Karangamite, the Liberal Party was driving around a large mobile billboard with the face of their candidate, Stephanie Asher, on the street where another Anzac Day service was being held. So during a moment of peace and reflection, the Liberal Party billboard truck could be seen and heard driving around and disturbing a solemn moment during a solemn day. Scott Morrison was texting on his mobile phone during the main Anzac Day speech at the Australian War Memorial, and in his own speech he inserted all of his campaign talking points, including the arc of autocracy, which we still haven't worked out the meaning of. Now some people might say, well, the Prime Minister texting on his phone during an Anzac Day speech, well, big deal, we've got more important issues to worry about. But it was a sign of disrespect and shows that for the Liberal Party, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, Everything is a political opportunity and available for a little bit of political marketing as well. I'm not a fan of the way Anzac Day has developed over the last decade or so. I am all in favour of a solemn commemoration and even a, even a day off. And you have the dawn service for veterans. You have the morning service for the public and then there's an evening service, and then the veterans can go off to the RSL and play two up or reminisce. Or, or now, there's a, a lot of veterans who've never liked Anzac Day. Eric Bogles, the band played Waltzing Matilda, and the young people ask, "What are they marching for?" And I ask myself the same question. It was a a bit more prominent of a belief than perhaps. It was meant to be. And the other thing, too, it was meant to hide the fact that Australia shouldn't really have gone to World War I, that Australia could have remained and defended its interests in New Guinea, which turns out would have been a diplomatic war. Gallipoli, and you talk about foolish leaders, was the racist assumption by Winston Churchill that the Turkish army would fold under a multi-nation army landing at a beach that was basically impregnable. It's actually embarrassing how far inland they got, which was hardly any. And for all Dutton's talk, would he be prepared to don the uniform and go to the front line? Now, I'll be fair to Churchill, he probably would have. I'll be fair to Tony Abbott, he probably would have too. Really, very few leaders acquit themselves well. John Curtin put the whole weight of the war effort onto his shoulder. This is the contributing cause to his early death. Just the stress of the four years of war where he kept things going and made sure that things were happening. I doubt many other politicians would have been prepared to strap on a rifle and go to the front line. So to see Scott Morrison on his phone during a service that goes no more than an hour was really disgraceful. I don't necessarily want to debate the merits of Anzac Day or how or why it's become one of the most sanctified days of the Australian calendar, but it is an important day for many Australian people. But it was a little bit surreal and out of place having a truck with political advertising interrupting an Anzac Day service. And back in 2015, we have to remember the Woolworths created an outrage when they launched their Fresh in Our Memories advertising on Anzac Day. So it's a fine line between outright commercialism and commemorating Anzac Day, but this is the sort of political activity that shouldn't be occurring. And any ramping up of war on Anzac Day is equally ridiculous. Talking up war with any country is foolish at the best of times. Peter Dutton talking about being prepared for war with China is totally irresponsible. But I think that China is big enough and wise enough to realise that the Australia-China relationship is far greater than the racist ambitions of some tin pot leaders like Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton during an election campaign. Scott Morrison is now warning China about crossing the red line, and that's in reference to the security agreement China has signed with the Solomon Islands. 
Morrison doesn't want to elaborate what crossing the red line actually means or what he'll do if China does cross that imaginary red line. He's claimed that he couldn't release any details due to national security issues, but for me, this sounds like not commenting on on water matters when Scott Morrison was immigration minister. But I think we do have to question the sanity of our leadership. Waging a war with China or talking about it is foolish and counterproductive, mainly for Australia. And it doesn't do anything to improve security and international relationships in the Pacific region. The Solomon Islands thing. One of the things that struck me is that Australia's real strength should be as a, as a leader in the Pacific Islands and that we should be helping the Pacific Islands and we should be supporting the Pacific Islands and that's how you spread your influence. Banging the drum in Europe and America and Africa does nothing and even Northern Asia, Northeastern Asia like Japan and China. Sure, we need trade and we need good relations with everyone, That that's fine, but It is around this region, the Pacific Islands and Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and those types of places where Australia could really make a good and positive difference. It could correct some of the wrongs of the past. It could make itself a frontline regional power. And with China going into Solomon Islands, it's blown the whole thing. It's just incredible. And to do this without a war shows just how weak and benign and ignorant the government is. I'm hoping that there are still really good people left in the Foreign Affairs Department. And Australian Foreign Affairs was, again, one of the best departments of its type in the world. I don't know how Foreign Affairs led it through. It feels like that this was steamrolled by the Prime Minister, who doesn't see the importance of geopolitical influence in the region. Oh, well, I think that also these dramas in the Solomon Islands, it does expose that myth about the Liberal Party being tough on international security. And we also have to remember what they said back in 2015 about water lapping on the doorstep of our Pacific neighbours. And that was Peter Dutton and Tony Abbott ridiculing the Pacific Island leaders before Scott Morrison informed them that there was a boom microphone above their heads. So they've never taken the concerns of climate change seriously anywhere, let alone in the Pacific region. The Liberal National Coalition has diminished Australia's role in the Pacific. They've cut back foreign aid. They've also reduced soft diplomacy measures in the area, such as Australia International and shortwave radio broadcasts. So they've done everything everything possible to signal to the region that they're just not interested in the region. So it's no surprise that China saw an opportunity to fill in this gap. And it's not just the Solomon Islands. China has provided infrastructure and support to Papua New Guinea and was providing infrastructure support to Australia through the Belt and Road Initiative. And Scott Morrison was very supportive of these investment projects and opportunities until he decided that he had an opportunity to denigrate China and seek a political benefit from doing this. So the China Solomon's Islands Agreement, I think that's the end result of this lack of interest in the region and it shouldn't really come as a surprise to anyone. No, it's less surprising than disappointing. Again, it shows the unfitness of the current iteration of the Liberal Party that nobody is surprised. That this assumption that they're poor countries that don't need our help And maybe not even our help, maybe just our support. When they did try and help Tonga, the ship broke down and then they gave Tonga coronavirus. You couldn't make that up. Rob Sitch and the guys from Utopia would have thrown that out as being too outrageous. That's not funny. It couldn't happen. And yet there it was. It just defeats me as to how, as a prime minister, you'd let it happen. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Drive
Another very exciting thing about election campaigns is opinion polls and there are a dime a dozen at the moment, there's quite a few coming out each and every week of the election campaign and there were two new opinion polls released during the week and there's absolutely no change in opinion polls and we also have to give out that usual caveat that these are opinion polls, it's not the actual election result. The Ipsos result showed a two-party preferred rating of 55% for Labor and 45% for the Liberal National Coalition. News poll was also released. That's 53% to 47%. There has been one slight change. Anthony Albanese is now the preferred Prime Minister in the Ipsos poll. 40% for Albanese to 38% for Morrison. And that's not too bad for someone. The media keeps telling everyone that he's unknown to the public and no one really knows who he is. Three weeks out from election day, and pre-polling starts in just over a week, it's hard to see what can change over this time. There's no real signature issue that can galvanise the community. Morrison will try and make the election about China, a fictitious carbon tax or gender issues or all sorts of other irrelevant issues. It still has the feel of a scattergun approach or the approach of a gambler, trying out different tactics and hoping something sticks or something works. Do you think it's getting just a little bit too late for this type of approach by Scott Morrison? He's always been yesterday's man. Always kind of been a has-been. And I know I'm being really harsh here, but we are hopefully heading to the end of his political career. And looking at it objectively, looking at it in terms of what has he achieved, looking at it in terms of what positive has he given to the country? It's not a lot. He's given nothing. He's taken a lot. We struggle to find any reforms or achievements of the government that are worth crowing about. I'm no fan of the Howard government, but it had achievement, a lot of which I didn't like, some of which I didn't mind, some of which was the type of thing that any government in the same position would have done, whether they were Liberal, Labor or When we look at the Morrison-Turnbull-Abbott government, there's nothing. Nine wasted years of travel allowance and investment portfolios and jobs for the girls and boys. And that's it. Oh, plenty of scandal. Loads of scandal. All governments have scandal, of course, but not every day. It's another thing, it seems. Uh, when we look at their very poor economic management, and it looks like that the interest rates will go up next month, a massive 25 points. That's going to hurt the property market in a great deal, and it's going to force a lot of people out of their homes. And then what are they going to do? They'll be out of office, actually. So, <laughs> But are they going to take responsibility for this? No, they're not. They're going to blame Labor. We're still in the middle of an election campaign, so political parties are not just going to give up and there's still time to turn things around. But we can see that Scott Morrison is now doing his best to try and muddy the waters. And these are classic conservative tactics. Bring the debate down to the issues that aren't really that important, but act as a distraction to the other important issues, such as the state of the economy. And this is on top of all the countless photo opportunities and political marketing that he's been engaged with as well. Labor has started pushing that idea that Morrison goes missing when there are problems that need to be resolved. And there hasn't been a direct reference to the big issue that he went on an overseas holiday during the worst Australian bushfires ever. And according to focus group testing, this is still Morrison's biggest negative factor. But I guess Labor can't push forward that idea too much that Morrison goes missing in action when their leader is actually missing at the moment, albeit for totally different reasons. Inflation figures were released during the week and the 5.1% consumer price index for the March quarter, that's the highest figure since 1990, that's 32 years ago. And as you alluded to before, there's speculation that the Reserve Bank will raise interest rates next week. And if they do, it will be the first time that this has happened during an election campaign since 2007. And 
I talked about the polls before. The Liberal National Coalition are between 6% to 10% behind in the opinion polls. And we also talked about the absence of a galvanising issue to claw back support. But interest rates going up, well, that's the galvanising issue that can turn the election. But this is going the other way for Scott Morrison. If interest rates do go up next week, can we say that that's the end of the Morrison government? Now, I'm going to be very fair here, and I I believe that they should try not to put interest rates up or down during an election campaign. Having said that, the economy has been managed so badly that it's come to this. If it goes up, I think it will, because they won't be able to blame Labor. Uh, Labor hasn't been in office for for 10 years. But even the most disengaged people realise that this is a federal issue and that interest rates are set federally. And it will probably kill off any hope he's got of scraping back a victory. He's lost all the bushfire-affected areas since 2019, and that's half the country. He's lost all the flood-affected areas, which is another third of the country. If he loses the mums and dads who are his bread and butter, and I put all that in inverted commas, because suddenly you can't afford to live a comfortable life, he's gone. There's no one to vote for him. We also invited our Patreon subscribers to ask us a few questions about the election campaign and we'll do our best to answer them. One of our supporters, Dragan, he asked about the importance of volunteering in local campaigns and also pointed out that usually it's the armchair critics that criticise the end result or post opinions about why their political party lost after the election result, but they never actually get involved. How important is it to participate in the political process or is it just easier to be the armchair critic, David. Speaking as an armchair critic, <laughs> I'm going to say it's very important, actually. And what we do, I think, helps in that we present fact and opinion that people can go away and think about. And if our listeners say, yeah, I listened to all that and I think you've made a really great case to vote for Clive Palmer, okay, <laughs> that's fine. But getting people to think letterboxing for the candidate you like or for the party you like, turning up to the public meetings. Candidates have told me of their frustration of booking a meeting and no one showing up. Maybe these candidates should be going more online. But even then, people aren't logging in. And doing things like, what has the government and what has the opposition done this week through reading the media? And sometimes you've got to hold your nose while you read through it. And then thinking clearly about what's being asked All of this, you don't actually have to join the party and become treasurer or secretary or, although I'm sure the parties would enjoy that and appreciate it. And that is whether it's a big party, Liberal, Labor, National or Greens, or whether they're the smaller party, Reason, Fusion. Sometimes it's just enough to campaign or to bring up faults with your local member. Sometimes just knowing. And of course, the most important thing you can do is vote. Now, I know that at least half of you have said, but David, this is Australia. Voting is compulsory. And it is. And I think it's one of the strengths of Australia. There's only six or seven countries in the world with compulsory voting. But when I say vote, I mean, understand how the preference system works. Understand how you can get the candidate you most want in. That if you put a minor party first, they get funding, even if you're in a safe Labor or Liberal seat. Oh, well, I'd prefer it if people became more involved in the democratic process, just a lot more than just turning up to vote every three or four years, but that's a matter for a different day. But modern election campaigns are taking on more of a managerial approach to campaigning, but centre-left parties are adopting more of a cluster model of political management, and this is known as the snowflake model, where different clusters are responsible for different activities within a campaign. So there's one team responsible for door knocking, another one for phone banking, then there's data management, media management, pre-polling, and then the booth management on the day itself. So this process itself isn't so new, but trying to engage people and involve people who feel that they have the most to gain or the most to lose from a particular election result, that's becoming more of a new strategy. And it's getting people involved to a level so that they feel that they're invested within that particular political campaign. But still getting these people involved, 
that's the issue. There's still a couple of issues that need to be taken into account. One is that a lot of campaign work is pretty boring and dull work and mm. not too many people are prepared to do that. It does take up a lot of time and energy. And there's also many people that don't want to be publicly involved in a campaign. They might not want to be seen by their neighbours or their friends to be openly campaigning for a particular political party. And I do know of some people that have lost friendships after they've been seen handing out how to vote cards on election day. But my approach is, well, it doesn't really matter what you do. Just do something, handing out flyers, handing out how to vote cards, putting up posters, guerrilla marketing, talking to friends about politics, putting up social media posts. Just get involved. Every little bit counts. And although I do agree with Dragan, it's probably best to do all of this before an election rather than complain about it after an election loss. And just a final question, another one of our regular listeners, Travis, he pointed out that in the media, the government seems to keep mentioning their talking points, usually without interrupting, yet all the pressure and questioning is placed upon the opposition. And then we seem to get journalists just repeating these government talking points. And I'm getting the sense that Travis is not very happy about this situation, nor am I. And he wants to know whether journalists feel that they'll lose access to government MPs if they critique them too much or if there's any other reasons for why this might be all happening. I think it's a mixture. I think certainly a a journalist who can get access to senior government figures is highly regarded. You tend not to get access if you're asking the hard questions. You also have a very small media landscape in Australia in that the five or six top news channels are owned by three or four people who own 90% of them. And it is in the interest, the business interests of the media proprietors. Fairfax and CBS, who own Channel 10, are primarily media. Murdoch is not primarily media. It's what we see him as, but in fact, he's got a lot of interest in oil and non-news media, such as publishing and uh, oil and gas and other mining. Kerry Stokes at Channel 7 is primarily in the mining industry. Oh, well, I agree that it's a combination of a number of different factors. It's the whims of the editors and the owners of those media companies. It is the fear of losing access to politicians if they say the wrong things. And we also have to remember that most journalists are not activists. And for many of them, it's just a job. They write the words, it gets published, they go home, they get their paycheck. And why jeopardise that, especially at a time when well-paid jobs in journalism are rare and you've got a family to feed, so just go and do the work that keeps you in the job. And for many mainstream journalists, they're usually from middle-class backgrounds, they're in relatively well-off situations, so whoever wins the election really isn't such a big deal for them. And not that I want them to support one party or another, I just want them to make politicians accountable to the public, and I don't think that's too much to ask for. That's what it gets down to. I do think that to mix news and opinion and 24-hour news too has been more damaging to public discourse. How often do you watch the news and then you watch it three or four hours later and it's the same story? And often the stories are quite irrelevant. Prime Minister still in meeting with world leader. Yeah, that'd be two hours. That'd be about right. We don't need this level of detail. Watching the Prime Minister hop into a plane to go to Kirribilli was sick-making, really. It, all we needed to know is that he'd gone to Kirribilli and called the election. Just insane. So that's the end of the third week of the campaign. It feels like it has gone on for a long time, but that's because we've paid attention, we've analysed, we've looked at the many different parts of the election campaign. A lot of the mainstream media finds it all a little bit too boring and tedious, but we're a little bit different. We find election campaigns very exciting. We've passed the halfway point at the moment. There's another three weeks to go of this campaign. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. If you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.